Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that. So uh, yeah, so we have we have uh, overcome the, uh, the 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 technical issues, and uh, yeah, and let us uh, come back to the question of what is Ukrainian offensive doing around Avdiivka and why Avdiivka is so important. As I told you, the uh, Avdiivka is a port of the eastern of the eastern offensive of the Russians, uh, which uh, consists out of the directions. The cities are very close to each other. Bakhmut, Marinka, Avdiivka. It is all the suburbia of Donetsk, very densely populated area before the full-scale invasion, before the war. Uh, a lot of structures, a lot of buildings, small buildings, bigger buildings, multi-story houses, small houses, private sector, as they call it, like the, the small houses where one family lives, garages, uh, technical buildings, and factories. And factories are extremely important, as in Avdiivka, the Ukrainian defensive position is mostly in Avdiivka Koksahim, Avdiivka coal chemistry plant. And it is something of a smaller scale compared to Azovstal. So it's also an industrial complex with a lot of um, a lot of huge rooms, a lot of underground constructions, a lot of concrete, steel, etc. So what the Russians tried, the Russians obviously wanted to demonstrate some success especially important for Vladimir Putin, as Vladimir Putin has his so-called presidential elections, which of course are not elections, but just like a sign of acclamation by the public. And they have them in spring. And before spring, Vladimir Putin wants to demonstrate his population that he has achieved some great victory. And because, of course, Russians don't know the geography of Ukraine, they just need to be presented some names, and it says, okay, like Marinka, we have got it, actually totally destroyed. Bakhmut, we have got it, totally destroyed. So now we take Avdivka. And for the Ukrainian army, the defense of Avdivka is important because they can stop the Russian offensive and they can neutralize the Russian manpower. They can destroy Russian tanks. They can destroy Russian infantry. They can do with the the russians uh just like just sterilize so to call their their army just like destroy so what uh, we did uh we have raised donations for uh the ukrainian army for the 47th brigade which fought before in uh zaporizhia around zaporizhia liberated robotina and now fight is fighting in avdivka and we have raised for them um uh, already like 150,000 in September, October, and now about 70,000 in December. And this 70,000 euro, we have bought night vision drones for that. And night vision drones are extremely important to provide the army with a chance to see the area in the night, to see the, where they're wounded or how they can evacuate them, where like, where they have like some, some problems, etc., etc. And drones are practically eyes and ears of every and each army unit. And drones get destroyed regularly by the Russian electronic warfare. That's why they need to be replaced all the time. That's why you need to bring them. And here I want to go into details as much as I may, uh, not to not disclosing like uh, sensitive information, but talking about what I have seen there with the uh, with the the soldiers. And I was uh, very privileged; I could spend uh, a day with them. Like I came in the evening, um, I spent evening with them. I slept um, in their in their rooms where they are being um, uh, dislocated, and uh, then we had like. Uh, discussions in the morning. Uh, I visited several positions of the uh, of the brigade where they do their stuff, and that was extremely interesting. Because mo- first, like all the soldiers, they are very young. They are very young. Like a soldier uh, who is my permanent contact is about like twenty two years old, and uh, like others are not much older. Some of the, some of them are younger. And they are all high motivated. They, uh, most of them, they are either volunteers or they have been conscripted, but they had nothing against it. They they wanted to go into the army and they were selected by their skills. Like some of some of them are elect- electrician, like engineers, uh, mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, etc. And they they know how to deal with the drones. 
And what they explained to me about the drones is really, really interesting. So first they said that how, how does it work? Like how, how we say that the Russians, they jam the drones, but what happens practically? Effectively, when the drone are stored, the operator of the drone has constant contact with the drone and can see what the drone sees in real time. So uh, for the Russians, it is important either to uh, locate the operator of the drone and hit him with the artillery. And that's why when the drone comes to the Ukrainian army, the first thing they do, they wipe out uh, the software and install their own software to uh, prevent the chance to locate the position of the drone operator because the factory installed IT allows uh, people with the right IT to, uh, to identify the geo position of the operator and hit him with mortar or artillery shot. Then what they do, they, uh, they store it to extend antennas so they, they don't want the antenna, uh, which operator uses, that this antenna is too close to the operator. It needs to be a bit further from the operator. So when the attack comes, the attack comes to the place where antenna is, not where the operator is. But here they have limitations of the distance. You cannot put it like 50 meter away or 100 meter away because of the strength of the signal. Like I'm not an, an expert here, but they explain me that the frequencies do not allow to, to, to have this antenna too, too long. And then they use the drone. Then the second problem comes because along the whole front line, the GPS doesn't work. Like you just cannot use GPS because it is jammed. So in a normal situation, when the drone loses, loses contact, radio contact with the operator, the drones know it knows its position, GPS position. The drone also knows the GPS position from where it stored it. And the drone just come can fly back to the position, but it cannot on the front line because GPS is jammed by the Russians. Ukrainians also jam it, but like just imagine that the drone like went over the Russian position. So GPS is jammed. It cannot come back. So what the Russians do, okay, what, what the drone can do in this situation, it either can just wait for a moment in the air, like for one minute, two minutes, in a hope that the uh, radio contact will be restored. It doesn't happen because it is not lost because of some like weather conditions. It is like jammed. The second um, idea was like it flies left and right, finding like the, 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 the better connection cannot happen. And then it can just slowly come down because it doesn't want to hurt anyone. And then it is lost forever. So that's how the drones get lost. And what the Russians do, uh, they're really sophisticated in jamming. And the operators told me stories like uh, the Russians have a jamming station. And when you fly with your drone, normally you see, OK, the signal is getting uh, lower and lower. You have problems. OK, maybe I'm entering the jammed area. Then the drone, I, I, I order the drone fly back and then the connection is restored. But the Russians, they, they really, they, they don't have it all the time. They, when they see that the drone's approaching, they just wait and then they turn on the jamming device when the drone is already in the field of 100% jamming and then the drone has no chance to come back. And then like in this case, like 5,000 or 7,000 euro drone is lost. And that's of course painful, but that is what uh, the, the, the war is. Another problem is, for example, that some drones are very fragile. And fragile means that when they land on the ground, when the operator is not skilled enough, it can just crash the drone by, by hard landing. And then once again, if 5,000 drone is get destroyed. And what the Ukrainians do, they, uh, they uh, enforce the uh, structure of the drone with like some, some uh, super glue, with some like additional coating, etc. They make this wings of the drones, these four, four legs of the drones with the propeller stronger. And that is what they do. They have workshops where they produce their own drones from the, from the, the parts they buy at AliExpress and they, they uh, produce FPV drones. 
and uh, not the thermal camera, vision drones, surveillance drones, but FPV drones, kamikaze drones. And then, like, I entered uh, like a room where uh, one soldier of the brigade is sitting, and he has a whole boxes of of grenades or of RPG uh, war hats or of other things like C4 or TNT, etc. And the only thing what he's what he was doing, he was like creating with the three D printed uh, tails. He created the 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 bomblets for the FPV drones, and that is what was he doing. And uh, then I asked the soldiers, like, um, there was the deficit of the uh, 155 millimeter shells, and we know that the United States stopped providing Ukraine with 155 artillery shells uh, since months, and Germany and France didn't have enough shells to uh, replace this gap. And um, how are they doing in this situation? They cannot hit Russians with artillery shells they don't have, right? And they said, uh, well, like um, a month or two ago, the situation was really severe because they couldn't replace anything. Uh, like they couldn't replace the, the missing shells with anything. Uh, but now they have uh, increased the production of FPV drones, and the FPV drones are actually making the job of 155 artillery shells. And that was amazing to see, because like they really boosted their own production on the territory of the brigade. They produced their own weaponry uh, from actually the, the devices which uh, were not designed for that, like the uh, German uh, grenades for automatic grenade launchers, or like the, the bricks of C4, or like they use the the tracer bullets, like uh, 12 uh, 0.7 millimeter caliber uh, machine gun tracer bullets. Uh, they they just um, took the tracer part and use it as the as the fuse for the bomblets. And that is very sophisticated job which they do. And they say, okay, we can do it now, uh, not without shells, like with the shells, it would be, of course, much better. But with this improvised FPV drones, they could do it much better than, than before. And uh, when I talked to them, they were all like in a good mood. They were um, really uh, like sure that they can still hold of Divka and can hold of Divka Coke. Uh, coke uh, coal plant and uh, it is really a very um, moving feeling when like you sleep a night on on a bank uh, and you know that you need to get uh, get to wake up uh, at seven because at seven a soldier comes from a deep coke coal plant back from 24 hour shift and he needs a sleep and you're actually occupying his his bank and so that is what happened in my case. Like at seven, a uh, soldier came and said, uh, oh, like, uh, uh, hi, good morning. And said, oh, okay, I have occupied your banks, you know, like take take this place and I will go and sleep in the car <laughs> further. Yeah, um, so the finalizing this port, the mood of the soldiers is good. They know what they do. They have food, they have uh, ammunition, they have creativity, and they know that they can protect this area and they use uh, their uh, position, their high ground to destroy Russian waves when the Russians, when they want to attack the Avdivka uh, coke uh, coal plant, they need to cross like fields, they need to be exposed to the Ukrainian fire and then the Ukrainians just eliminate these waves. So uh, then I think that uh, this is uh, enough about Avdivka. Uh, yeah, um, one, 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 one funny situation was it was pretty easy to go there by car and uh, much easier than to go back. Because when you go there by car, uh, the whole way from Kiev to Avdivka uh, was is about like 700 kilometers. And uh, I've got only one checkpoint when you leave Dnipro region and enter uh, Donetsk region. And uh, it was in the night, and uh, it's a nasty feeling when you drive uh, without any street lights, etc. And the road is uh, in not perfect condition because tanks are using this road. And sometimes you see a tank left or right, you see like some military equipment, 
then you see like on the horizon i don't know if it was high mars i don't think it was high mars i think it was like air, air defense but missiles like uh, come come into the uh, air and uh, nothing more and then you come to a checkpoint and the soldier stops you and they ask like where are you going um and they said, like, do you have any alcohol with you? And then I, I uh, realized that it is forbidden to bring alcohol into a war zone. I said, no, I don't have. Like, uh, what do you bring? Uh, and so the soldier said, uh, yeah, I see that the new people uh, come. Yeah, um, hello. Um, hi, Yulia. Great to uh, great to see you here. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the soldiers asked, like, what do you bring? I said, like, I bring drones. Yeah, I was a soldier. No, I'm a I'm, I'm, I'm volunteer. Uh, I said, okay, like, 10... Then, then just 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 drive through and that was the only checkpoint but when you go back you can like every like every 50 kilometers you have a checkpoint and that is of course understandable because uh the they they want to check like what do you bring do you bring like weapons or something like the ukrainians really take this security and safety issue very seriously they really control your course what you bring what comes back into the country from the front line, etc. Okay, so uh, my next stop uh, there uh, in Ukraine was uh, Kherson region in the south. And Kherson region uh, was liberated up to the Dnipro River, like this, the, the north bank of Kherson region, including the city of Kherson itself, was liberated uh, in November uh, 22. And uh, the Ukrainian army stopped practically at the Dnipro River, and they were staying there until June last year, or uh, June 23, when the Russians destroyed the Novakhovka uh, power plant dam. And what did it mean? Like, we all remember all these pictures of flooded territories, etc. Novakhovka water reservoir is three times larger on its square than the Lake Constance the biggest lake in Europe. And uh, all this water NOS came down and has flooded a lot of villages. And um, it was a really, really terrible situation when the Russians didn't let people with Ukrainian passports to evacuate. They installed checkpoints and forced people with Ukrainian passports to stay in the flooded area. We don't know until now how many people died. I don't think we will ever know that because many corpses have been flushed down into the sea. Uh, but the number of victims is uh, clearly four digits, like some thousands of, of people have died, maybe tens of thousands, we don't know. But what happened after the Novakovka water reservoir disappeared? What happened is that the whole this area has turned into a huge piece of, 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 okay, there are interesting effects, a piece of land. And uh, we need to understand that the Dnipro River, before the Kachovka Dam has been installed in the early 1950s, had, like, it flew through uh, a pretty flat territory what the Ukrainians called a great meadow or a great grassland. And Dnipro River was very curvy with a lot of small lakes and, and uh, like small streets, etc. And this region was the region of Zaporizhia Cossacks. They have installed their camps there, they had their villages there, churches, etc. 300 years of existence of Zaporizhia Cossacks happened actually in this area which have been flooded in 1950s so now when this area was relieved from the water and the water reservoir was not that deep it was like in average three five meters deep so it wasn't a huge lake according to the depth it was a pretty flat area which had been flooded for the level of let me say three five top 10 meters and when all this water went away, what came from this from these, uh, area? Old villages, churches, uh, all the cultural artifacts have been revealed. I visited one of the, uh, one of the villages on the shore of Novakahovka uh, water reserve where I talked to the city major 
And he uh, he's a historian on his education said, like, I could miss an opportunity. I just went to this this area and every time I came back, I came back with something with me. He found like old artifacts, the Cossack, Cossack uh, um, sabers, the Cossack old guns, cannons, uh, like some, some crosses, everything which accompanied the life of people for many generations was revealed from this water. I personally took an opportunity to walk like for five minutes around this area. And I found an old horseshoe there. Like it was just laying around. So you just really go there, you find there. What was not comfortable is that the whole this area is being under Russian fire control. So the Russians use the drones which fly over this territory. They use artillery shell shellings and they can hit you with a sniper fire. So the distance uh, between the, the two shores is between, let me say, three miles, maybe two miles, and um, let me say 15 miles in the most, like in the biggest ports, of course, like something 20, 30 miles, what we talk about the, the narrow ports. So both sides try to uh, observe what is going on on another shore, and if they can uh, hit the other shore if they see like military movement or any, any other movement which looks suspicious they can send a drone an fpv drone or something like that so uh, when you walk around you you hear distant explosion and that what was my case and um you you just know okay like maybe maybe the next shell will come and hit me so you don't need to to to, to walk around because otherwise you can find out but the question comes, what to do now with this uh, former great reservoir and with this great media? Because what happened in, um, let me say, what happened in um, June last year? When in June last year, the Novakovka water reservoir disappeared to exist, stopped to exist. Uh, many believe that this area, this huge area, three times Lake Constance, will remain uh, inhabitable. Like nothing will grow up there because like you just like took huge territory. How can you put seeds on all this area? Like it will stay um, empty. And people believe that when water went down, this whole area will remain just huge like square of mud. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. When I first visited this great media in uh, last September, I was absolutely surprised by how green it is and how much smaller trees are to be seen there. Like you stay at the shore in uh, Novaka Terenivka, south of Zaporizhia, and you look around, you stay on the shore, which is about maybe 10 meter high, and you see this flatland, and it is all green, and it's not grass. It is like about one and a half meter high trees. How did it happen? And it was actually uh, some sort of uh, luck in a tragedy that the Russians have blown up the, the Novaka Hofka Dam in, uh, in June. Because what happened in the spring? In spring, a lot of trees which stay along of Dnipro River and channels and small rivers, they produced millions, billions of seeds. And all these seeds, they fall down into the water. And the water came to Kofka Reservoir. And of course, like on one point or another, these seeds go down. And in a normal situation, they would have never, they would have never grow up in any tree because they will just lay for years and years on the water and some, on one day they will decay or the fish will transform them into something, or mollusks, um, like crawfish or something, will just eat them. But in June, in a warm time of the year, the water disappeared, and all these seeds were still intact. And they were laying on a wet, mud, absolutely fertile, after 60 years of being... Uh, being the 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 um the bottom of a water reservoir, so the seeds had enough water, enough fertility, if uh, fertility, uh, enough of fertile soil, and they had time and they had 
uh, sunlight. So they started to boom, they started to grow, and now we have a real forest there. Like it's small forest, maybe like one and a half meter, two meter. This this uh, simple trees which normally grow around the around the uh, um, the the uh, the water reservoirs, but it is covered by uh, by some sort of uh, uh, of trees, and that means that there is no erosion anymore. And people believe that uh, the ecologists or the agriculture experts, they believe that in some years, new trees will appear uh, more sustainable, more sustainable, more uh, more powerful, and it will be a forest. And then it will be question up to Ukrainians what they want to do with that. Do they want to have a national park? Do they want to have a part of this soil as agricultural land? Do they want to re-establish some uh, fish farms there because during the water reservoir time there had been fish farming there but now uh, they still have like some lakes on this flatland so they can have some fish farming etc we don't know it yet but the area is indeed very interesting and if it will remain mostly as a forest it will be the largest forest in central europe once again three times more square of Lake Constance. Uh, and it is amazing to see how it will uh, function. Um, the problem there in that region is, of course, uh, landmines and luxes, like unexploded ordnance. And uh, when you go around, you see there are remains of there are buildings which have been hit by the Russian artillery over the fighting. There are uh, remains of burnt tanks or IFVs or trucks. And there are all around the signs uh, about the mine danger. Like, uh, you may not enter some fields, um, you just you just stop. And uh, when I talk to the, the city council of a small village there, and the city council consists of three women uh, in age of about like 25 and 35, the village has lost about like 60% of its population. Uh, during the Russian occupation and then fightings, etc. And they said, like, uh, they, they started to discuss with me the questions of uh, demining, like how they need to demine the fields, how the farmers uh, localize the, 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 the landmines or artillery shells, how they call the, uh, the army so the army could uh, remove this shell. And they discussed it all in a normality tone, as if it was uh, the part of their life forever. And that was actually, on one hand, it was a great sign that they know what to do and they know how to restore normality. On another hand, it was a terrible sign because you see how easy uh, the war comes into our reality and remains there. Because everything they could talk about was about uh, how to demine the fields, how to repair the destructions. Or, for example, when they discussed the um, the plans of uh, children's uh, children's uh, uh, music or some other event, like to just to bring children some Christmas mood. The first thing they discuss in what uh, village they do it not too close to the front lines so the russians could not hit this area with artillery or with missiles or with drones and that is actually a pretty uh, nasty situation when the first thing you think about when you organize some christmas uh, party for your kids in your village then you think first about uh, in what part of our pretty large community we organize it so the russians will not hit our kids with artillery that is terrible and you see a lot of destruction there a lot of destruction um so um the uh, that was like the part of the Kherson. if you once again if you have your uh, questions um please please write them in your chat i will try to answer them so um they have, of course, the infrastructure problems there. Like um, one year ago, they had the water supply from the water reservoir. Now the water reservoir is gone and all normal water supply uh, systems don't work anymore because they, they don't have water. 
So what they do is they revive older water wells, which are well from the pre-water reservoir time. So these water wells come deep enough to the water horizons, which existed before the before the uh, water reservoir time from the 19th century or early 20th century. They clean them, they enforce them, and they install new supply system for the for the village. So the city manager told that they install uh, like 11 or 15, I don't remember, but it's more, more than 10, a new water wells where every person can come and can get like uh, can get uh, water which they can drink or use for other purpose and this water of good quality so you can really drink it from the well and of course for those like who, who exist they can organize supply of uh, water in in bottles and that is also very interesting how how the community revives and uh, reinstalls the the basic the basic infrastructure for uh, for the survival so uh, then I came back to, to Kiev, and um, of course in Kiev the question was like, what what comes next? Like how how people live? What will come with the mobilization? Because the Ukrainian army needs to replace hundreds of thousands of soldiers, which are are fighting on the front line, and many of soldiers they they are volunteers. They have volunteered. Uh, early the full-scale invasion in March, April, May 22, and they didn't calculate for how long they will stay in the army, how long they will fight, because nobody said that the war will continue for the third year. And now many of them are tired, many of them say, okay, like, I have invested my part, I spent two years in trenches, I lost my friends, I lost my health, uh, like, even if people are not wounded, their health is uh, severely uh, damaged by cold weather, by inhaling of smoke, by stress, uh, by by other things. Like just think about the trench feet when you walk all the time in the wet uh, wet shoes, and your skin starts to, uh, to 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 release from your from your feet, and you can get like up to amputation. Of your feet, just because your all your feet are always uh, are always exposed to uh, cold temperatures and and moisture. So many of these people want to go home, but the army cannot let them go home because they don't have replacement because not enough people volunteer. You see advertising uh, on the streets of Ukraine, also in Kiev. Uh, volunteer to that army, to that brigade, and some brigades, they make advertising for themselves, saying, like, our brigade is the best, we have the best tradition, morality, the best commanders, you can just, like, go directly, straight directly to our brigade, and you are sure you get, like, to the best unit you can have, but it's not enough. So, uh, in the Ukrainian parliament, there is discussion. Uh, what should they do with the mobilization? And uh, the general mobilization is not what is very popular in Ukraine, like in any country, like nobody wants to be conscripted and go uh, to the front line with where the chances are high that you get killed or injured. But many understand that it is, um, it is inevitable. Uh, if you want to uh, fight this war, you need to replace at least some of the soldiers. And... Then, like, you can hear interesting discussions when you walk in the streets or you sit in cafes and listen to what people are saying among each other. And uh, I've encouraged, encountered, for example, a group of uh, three young females. Uh, we were staying on the street crossing, city light, uh, street light, and uh, while we were waiting for the green to cross the streets, I could listen what they were talking about. And one of these um, young uh, females, uh, which looked like absolutely like hipster-like, she said that uh, she has nothing against uh, that women should be conscripted and she would be conscripted too. Uh, because she said like it is what uh, what his uh, equality means and to what uh, everyone should do for, for their country. And that was very interesting to, to listen uh, that or to hear that 
from a, uh, like in the center of uh, the capital in Ukraine from a street shot of like some some uh, random group of uh, young people who were probably coming from like some event or cafe or or uh, university uh, meeting and that shows that the the Ukrainian society really understands deep in their heart that they they need to go further and to sacrifice more I'm really very sorry to say that uh, that this sacrifice should be equally equally dispersed to uh, equally distributed to all the uh, parts of the population while once again we have people who want to escape the conscription who want just to go out and uh, every day like you have news that somebody wanted to cross a border river but it was too cold and this young uh, young male could not cross the river and was saved by the border police and now will be charged with uh, like uh, actually with very small like uh, monetary monetary fine like 30 US dollar or 50 US dollar for an attempt to cross the border without permission but that shows a very different aspects of how this uh, problem has been discussed in the society and of course uh, nobody wants to be a person in the politics who introduced this law of the uh, of the mobilization and the um like everyone tries to push the responsibility to another party or to the army saying yes it is what the army wants from us to to introduce and then uh, General Zaluzhny comes, the um, uh, supreme commander of uh, the Ukrainian army, and says, no, it was not our decision how much we need to, to mobilize. We just say we need soldiers, and it's up to the politics how the soldiers um, get mobilized, etc. So it is an uh, interesting uh, tag of war uh, in the political sense of who will be the face of this necessary but unpopular legislation and how it will how it will uh, be wrapped in 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 what technical assistance from the west and what happens and here we come to another part of the uh, discussion which i wanted to uh to touch during this uh during this hour and please if you have like your questions please uh comment um or please ask them um, via the chat and I will try to to answer them. But another thing is the um, the security uh, the security uh, treaty uh, between the UK, United Kingdom, and Ukraine. And this is a very interesting thing because today um, the Prime Minister of the UK, Mr. Sunak, came to uh, Kiev, and he was celebrating. Kiev, he uh, held his speech in the Ukraine parliament, was celebrated with standing ovation uh, because the UK is really one of the most important allies of Ukraine and provide Ukraine with uh, necessary equipment uh, as one of the first nations even before the full-scale invasion and stayed with Ukraine up to now and provide Ukraine with uh, long-range missiles, uh, storm shadow, which are extremely effective against the Russian uh, military objects. And today, Mr. Sunak uh, visited Ukraine, and he not he has not only confirmed and reconfirmed the uh, pro-Ukrainian course of the British government, but also signed this uh, treaty on the security cooperation between Ukraine and uh, and the UK. Why it is important? This agreement foresees intensive ten years long cooperation with Ukraine, which can be prolonged after uh, these 10 years or can be expired uh, or not not expired can be replaced by NATO membership of Ukraine and uh, this agreement this treaty says very clearly that uh, the United Kingdom will provide Ukraine with weapons and <coughs> sorry in particular this treaty foresees delivery to Ukraine long-range missiles and tanks and other equipment which can destroy the Russian defense. And that is extremely important because, for example, what Germany delivers to Ukraine, and Ukrainians are really thankful for Germany, for what Germany does, 
but Germany delivers mostly air defense uh, systems and some other equipment which can be used on the front line but doesn't have enough firepower or long range firepower especially to uh, destroy the Russian defense, the Russian um, warehouses, the Russian infrastructure, etc. And the United Kingdom focuses uh, on exactly on this firepower and they stress it in the treaty. The treaty doesn't foresee any concrete numbers except of the overall number of military support for the next year, 2.5 billion, and the number of infrastructure support also over i think over two billion uh but it doesn't name any special uh weapon systems or numbers of weapon systems etc but it says that uh this uh, this agreement uh can be expanded by agreements with certain uh like institutions in, in the uk or it can be a fundament of development of new legislation so here we clearly see a very massive agreement which foresees delivery of um, a lot of firepower for the Ukrainian army, but not only. It foresees cooperation in uh, cyber defense, in reconstruction of Ukraine, support of infrastructure reconstruction of Ukraine. It foresees uh, British activities in uh, pushing Russia to pay for the destruction in Ukraine, like uh, confiscation of Russian funds, sanctions against Russia, and also foresees uh, the UK's commitment for the NATO membership of Ukraine, which is also very important. So here I think that an extremely important step has been done, and such agreement is the first one uh, which has been uh, signed between Ukraine and the major Western player. And as President Zelensky said today, uh, if such agreement had been signed in 1991, uh the uh, russian invasion hadn't happened or at least uh, had a lot of problems uh the russia would have had a lot of problems with its invasion because this agreement is really strong compared for example to the budapest uh, memorandum uh emir uh writes here the brits uh have been great uh uh, Boris Johnson was out on the front uh, foot well before even the Americans getting us and laws and javelin from Europe. And further, he writes, it's time for Scholz to free the bulls. Uh, yes, I totally agree. The uh, uh, government of uh, Boris Johnson, uh, despite all the internal questions which the Brits have to their former prime minister, I don't interfere in this internal political discussion in the UK, but what Boris Johnson did for Ukraine uh, was um, absolutely, absolutely uh, amazing. And um, I think that none of the other countries could compare to the UK on the scale of the support and the, the quality. Maybe the Poles were as quick as the Brits and also provided a lot of equipment. Uh, but the Brits have provided the equipment which was absolutely unique and uh boris johnson is really a person uh, which ukrainians adored then and i think adore now uh and he's really a very uh, popular person in ukraine and uh, regarding um our german federal chancellor uh mr schultz um uh, i as a german citizen i cannot understand why the german federal government is so reluctant on the topic of uh, providing Ukraine with the Taurus missiles. And um, I cannot see any logical explanation of this reluctancy. I can see like some uh, quasi-religious beliefs that uh, this delivery uh, can cause some bad consequences for Germany. But there is absolutely no logic uh, behind these beliefs. And it is really sad to see that even the parts of the federal government like the Greens or the Liberals who used to be uh, pretty effective in pushing Scholz to deliver, for example, Leopard 2 tanks a month ago, uh, one year ago, actually one year ago, that these, uh, that these parts of the federal government um, have decided to remain silent after the Leopard 2 have been delivered. 
and now don't um, don't uh, pressure Scholz at all regarding the uh, delivery of Taurus, despite the fact that over 50% of the German citizens say that uh, Germany should increase the level of its military support for Ukraine. So the uh, German people really stays uh, behind Ukraine and really demands from the government more support here. So it is like really a mystery of Mr. Scholz and his reluctancy. Um, um, if you have any other uh, questions to discuss, uh, please write them in the chat. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, I think we can wrap this discussion up, and um, and then like we can we can say that actually like most of the questions have been discussed, and we have uh, touched the question of of Divka, we have touched the question of Kherson, we have touched the question of Kiev mobilization, um, even the uh, internal political discussion. Uh, between uh, Zeluzhny and Zelensky, and uh, now the uh, Treaty on Security Cooperation and Security Guarantees between between the UK and uh, Ukraine. So, if you have any 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 um, comments or remarks or questions, feel free to write them in the chat. Otherwise, I think. Um, I can wrap it up. It was really great pleasure and privilege to to uh, have this live chat. Um, okay, Emmer is asking, uh, will you be having Gustav Grassel uh, back anytime soon? I hope so much. I hope so much, and I will uh, actually. I, I I wanted to 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 write Mr. Grassel a message these days, like after I come back from Ukraine. He is indeed uh, a great person, one of the uh, most clear minds in in the Central European uh, military analysis, and a very brave person who openly speaks uh, on important things, not uh, not trying to uh, escape the 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 consequences of the criticism or from from, from the people who don't see it as clear as he does uh, so he's really a great person very clever mind and uh, person of integrity so i think we should have mr gressel soon on our podcast and yes uh if you want to support the 47th uh, mechanized brigade of ukraine uh, because we will not stop to we will not stop providing the guys uh, with uh, the the drones and with other equipment uh you may find uh the the donation link on my twitter uh, you also may open the uh, the web page of our uh, of our think tank. It is uh, European Resilience ORG. Uh, you can see it in the chat. You will see our donation campaigns there and the ways to donate for them. You may also see all uh, the 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 ways to support our day by day work, like with buy me a coffee or Patreon. Uh, not only the campaigns per se, but also our day-by-day work. Feel free to do it. Uh, really highly appreciate it. And yes, the next question came from uh, Mr. Car Records. Uh, there are rumors of a stop of shelling, a defeat of Russian forces in Avdivka. Uh, do you know something about this? Um, can you uh, please explain uh, what do you mean on the defeat of Russian forces. You mean that the Russian forces have been completely defeated in Avdivka or or, or, or what? Uh, uh, please uh, concretize and uh, parallel. I will try to, to answer this question as much as I have understood it. Um, Avdivka, I'm not sure if you have um, visited this video or you have already been in this video uh, when I described the situation around Avdivka. And Avdivka is a um, former town, like now mostly destroyed, um, with like several dozen thousands of population, and um, responsibly uh, and respectively, uh, respectively dense uh, structure of buildings, um, shops, garages, uh, banks, uh, police stations, etc. 
So it made the uh, the area a pretty good area for defense because you have a lot of structures, you can hide, you can have observation points, etc. And they had the Avdivka coal plant. And the coal plant is a large structure with a lot of concrete buildings, a lot of steel, a lot of underground facilities, uh, a lot of higher buildings like towers, observation points for the for the railway transport, etc. So this made the defense of Avdivka exactly as defense of Bakhmut or Marinka a pretty good uh, bargain for the Ukrainians. Um, oh, yeah, I see. Um, no, I would not say that shelling um, stopped. I've been in Avdivka on Saturday, Sunday, and uh, one can hear shelling pretty much, I can assure you. Uh, but uh, the Russians uh, could not take Avdivka. And when I was talking to the soldiers there, um, you you see that they that, that they have these twenty four hours shifts at Avdivka uh, coke uh, coke uh, uh, coal plant. So they they go there, they 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 defend the area, then they come back, they sleep, the next soldiers uh, take their place, etc. So uh, the fighting is still there. Uh, the Russians still try to take Avdivka, and uh, it is obvious that Vladimir Putin wants to get some more names of the Ukrainian cities conquered. Actually, they took ruins, but conquered uh, before the so-called elections uh, in spring this year. So Putin could just proclaim his military operation, as you say, a success. Uh, like they have taken Marinka, they have taken Bakhmut, now they take Avdivka, nobody knows in Russia where it is, but everyone knows that it is a sign of a great uh, military mastermind of the Russian lead. So uh, the Russians continue to attack. It is actually good for the Ukrainians because the Russians attack there where the chances on success are very low. So the Russians just lose uh, tanks and manpower, etc. You have some districts in Avdivka where you have over a hundred of battle tanks just staying in the forest, burnt down. Over a hundred. And that is really uh, incredible. The Russians have lost around Avdivka more tanks than any European army has. Any. Any single European army has less tanks than Russians have lost around Avdivka. And they still continue to come, and the Ukrainians continue to uh, neutralize them. Does it mean that the Russians have no chance to take Avdivka? Uh, no, it doesn't. Theoretically, the Russians can push more, they can bring more main power. After the uh, so-called elections, Putin can declare like new a mobilization wave, he may just conscript another 200,000, 300,000 people, uh, low quality soldiers, demotivated soldiers, um, soldiers with health problem, alcoholism, uh, um, you name it. Um, they try since months mobilize people of other nations, Ukrainians capture more and more foreigners on the front line from all possible countries, Somalia to Pakistan, Nepal, Brasilia, like everything. The Russians uh, issue student visa in Southeast Asia countries like Nepal. When the people come to study to Moscow in one month, the Russians say them your visa will expire soon and you will be deported back to your country. But if you want to have uh, indefinite residence permit, go to the army, Russian army, like spend six months on the front line and you will get indefinite uh, residence permit. The Russians make the same uh, advertising, like uh, get a Russian citizenship after one year of service uh, in the army and fighting in Ukraine. So the Russians really try to tap the new sources of manpower. And the soldiers like being captured, they sometimes completely disoriented. They don't speak even Russian or very broken Russian. Um, there is a question how these soldiers get controlled by their commanders because the Ukrainian experience is to have, when they have foreign volunteers, they have a homogeneous language unit like 
all people from South America surf in, for example, in, um, except Brasilia, of course, in a Spanish-speaking battalion, or people from Canada and the US, an English-speaking battalion, and there is like a German-speaking unit or Russian-speaking unit. And uh, that is how the Ukrainians do it. They have the commander of this battalion who speaks Ukrainian, but the commander talks to, to his uh, soldiers in their native language. The Russians, as far as I know, don't have like Somalia or Nepal or Brazil battalion, but they have soldiers who lived in Russia for some time and speak broken Russian, so they installed them, they put them into like different units. But um, as far as I see, like uh, the, the, the success is not that great. So, uh, yes, and but that means that Vladimir Putin tries to find new manpower and tries to. Uh, to save uh, the, the the people from Moscow and Petersburg of two biggest cities in, in Russia, like two real profiteers from uh, the, the, the the Russian uh, dictatorship on economic means, uh, to save them from from dying in Ukraine. So he tries to to tap to poor people from the province or uh, foreigners or prisoners, etc. But I think that Putin will still be able to conscript after his so-called elections to conscript like some hundred thousand of people. And they will, of course, they will throw them in to the front line and try to push through the Ukrainian defense. If Ukraine will manage to hold a Divka, I'm not sure, but Ukraine can always push back step by step to another fortified position. And if we calculate uh, the, the, the ratio between the Russian success on the field and the Russian losses on the field, the Russians have captured during this campaign uh, since summer 22, the Russians have captured 0.1% of the Ukrainian territory. 0.1%. And for that 0.1%, they have paid about 100,000 soldiers' life. Like, that is incredible numbers, and that is absolutely un 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 unsustainable. And, uh, yes, and I, I, I cannot imagine for how long the Russians can do it if Ukraine gets, for example, enough of long-range missiles or jets or a permission to hit Russian military bases uh, with these long-range missiles, Russian military bases on the territory of Russia. Um, so that's why the, the soldiers in Avdivka had a very positive mood when I spoke to them. They said, okay, like we are doing our job and we don't see for the Russians any chance for strategic success. So they they, they, they can come and come and we continue to, to, to kill them and kill them. Uh, which is, of course, not the, the, the lifestyle any person wishes, but uh, in a case of war, it is actually the, the best situation when you pay a very low price for very high losses of the enemy. Um, so coming back to the, uh, to the uh, questions, um, uh, yeah, Amir is writing, I think uh, the Avdivka troops have been relocated for the attack on Kupians. That can be, because the Russians always try like, to, 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 to bring soldiers from one part of front to another part of front. Um, uh, but it doesn't mean that they have completely abandoned the idea of taking Avdivka. Uh, do you have updates on the current de uh, development in uh, Moldova, especially regarding Transnistria? Uh, well, I haven't seen like anything uh, huge there, um, but uh, the situation in Moldova and in Transnistria always remains uh, tense because the Russians still control the, uh, the so-called separatist government of Transnistria, de facto the Russian proxy. And the Russians have their, uh, their influence there, economic, military, security, and of course the Russians have their influence in Moldova itself with the pro-Russian uh, parties. And they tried already to organize a coup in Moldova early the full-scale invasion in summer 22. And of course, they haven't abandoned these plans. The problem for the Russians and good for us is that the Russians have completely con lost control over the uh, most parts of the Black Sea. Most parts of the Black Sea. Uh, they had to relocate their fleet, their Black Sea fleet, to Novorossiysk on the Russian uh, east bank of the Black Sea and partly to Abkhazia, to Russia, occupied territory of uh, Georgia, Sekretvelo. And that means that 
the Russians cannot support the Transnistria um, operation from the sea. What Russians do from the Black Sea, they can launch cruise missiles, um, naval-based cruise missiles against Ukraine, but they cannot operate in the western part of the Black Sea. And without Black Sea control and without the land control in Odessa region, and Russians will never have that control in the foreseeable future, uh, any operation in Transnistria uh, can only be failed. Like they can try to to organize a coup in Moldova, I would say in this case uh, the Ukrainians will just help the uh, legitimate uh, Moldovan government to restore peace uh, in the region. And uh, I cannot see how Russians can support this coup, which they will try to camouflage as revolution or something. To, to be successful. So I don't think that Moldova and Transnistria can be a problem, a real problem for the next time. But of course, uh, the question remains with uh, Russian drones flying through the airspace of Moldova, Russian drones fly, flying through the airspace, a cruise missile of Romania. We know that it happens regularly. We know that some drones even fall on the Romanian territory. Uh, NATO still does direct on that. And that is really a problem because every time we let the Russians violate the NATO airspace in Romania or in Poland, as it happened many times, we actually encourage the Russians to push more. And we provide the Russians with an illusion that they can attack NATO uh, without any consequence. And that is a very dangerous thing because as soon as Russians believe they can attack someone without consequence, they attack you. And uh, the moment when we let the Russian drones fly through the airspace of Romania, that was the case when the German interceptors uh, located in our uh, stationed in Romania as a part of NATO defense mechanism, they took to the air, uh, they accompanied these drones, but they have not got an order to destroy them, so they just let them transit the Romanian airspace and attack Ukraine. It was a very bad sign was a very bad sign, was a very encouraging sign for the Russians and very bad sign for the NATO. Uh, then let's move to the next border, Belarus. Um, silence since Wagner coup. Do you expect surprise from this Ukrainian neighbor? No, I do not. Uh, like, uh, Belarus was extremely important for the uh, first phase of the full-scale invasion. Um, like uh, the Russians decided to attack Ukraine, not in 22, not 21, but in 22, exactly after the preparation to the invasion in uh, May 21, when they realized that stationing the invasive troops, uh, invasion troops only along the Russian Ukrainian border is not enough. They need to attack Kiev from two sides, from Belarus and from Russia. And uh, for Alexander Lukashenko, it was a um, very big victory as he uh, only provided territory for Russia, but didn't send his troops into the war. So for him, it was always a guarantee that he can pull back and say in The Hague that he was manipulated, he was forced to provide the territory, he was occupied by the Belarusian army. Uh, didn't participate in the invasion. I think he was thinking about the Hague from the very beginning. So um, the rumors about that the Russians will try to repeat this Kiev invasion, they came in the year 23, but I don't see how it is possible because um, the territory is now heavily mined. The Ukrainians are well prepared for fighting back any invasion. The Ukrainians have quite another weapons. The Ukrainians have quite another military experience. And if that invasion failed in, 20, in February 22, there is no chance that it will be successful in, let me say, February 24. So what I uh, expect is um, that the Russians will try not to conquer more land, but to hold what they have now, and try to push the United States, Germany, and other major players into the illusion that uh, Russia cannot be pushed militarily from, from these territories. 
just to convince the the U.S. administration or German chancellor uh, that what Mr. Shorup is saying constantly or that some German experts or so-called experts, I don't call them experts, um, like self-proclaimed experts say that Russia cannot be defeated, Ukraine is too weak, we need to like freeze the conflict and then reach some deal and then Putin will stop and we will get out of this war. This idea is extremely dangerous. It will bring nothing. The Russian forces will just be rebuilt for the next attack. I don't I don't mention the fact that the uh, the the uh, uh, Ukrainian population on the occupied territories will continuously be exposed to all possible terror which one can imagine. And um, I have recently uh, translated and published a summary of an interview with a Ukrainian prisoner of war who spent nine months in Russian captivity. What he describes is absolutely uh, terrible. It is unhuman. It is the level of torture in the Gulag or in Auschwitz or uh, in in some Japanese death camps uh, during the World War II, etc., constantly beating, hunger, executions, uh, uh, mutilation of, 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 of prisoners of war, uh, torture for fun, uh, rape, uh, and, and, and. Um, and this is what will continue to happen if we let this conflict, this war freeze, and uh, which is uh, worse enough, uh, which is bad enough, but which is much worse is that this will help the Russians to... Uh, stockpile ammunition to buy new missiles from North Korea, Iran, to build new tanks, to train new army, to 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 develop new plans, to buy more Western politicians, to install more subversive missions uh, in our governments, to prepare for cyber attacks on our defense systems, to buy our our experts, to 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 buy our uh, our our defense uh, engineers, and 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 to prepare the next attack. That is the worst thing which we can uh, allow happen, and uh, that is not what, what 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 may happen. So that will be the Russians' idea, the Russians' hope to keep what they have, to subverse the West, and to prepare for the next attack. Not to just reach some huge effect now, because if they could not conquer these regions in twenty two, they will not be able to do it in twenty four. What they need, they want to weaken Ukraine and weaken the West, and then look for the next chance to attack. But I hope that Ukrainians will not let them do it. Um, uh, on the Black Sea, uh, Maluk just announced a new super drone for taking out the Kerch Bridge. That is even bigger than the Sea Baby drones called Kozak Mamai. Uh, yeah, um, the Ukrainians are very creative in uh, producing drones extremely creative and sea drones is their uh like uh, their absolute uh domination domain i don't know any other nation which has that much development of sea drones and it is interesting that actually the black sea is ideal for using drones because drones are never about control of the sea but about interdiction like if you have drones you don't really control the sea you cannot like attack the seashore you cannot uh, uh land your amphibious troops there but what you can do you interdict the others from doing anything and uh sea drones are are perfect for contained waters like uh areas which are limited by 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 geography you cannot use drones like or drones which we have now in like atlantic or pacific ocean because the distance is huge because the waters are tough uh because the the you need to have like a lot of fuel to to reach the torch etc but on the black sea or baltic sea it is ideal like drone is practically sea drone is practically a clever cruise missile and uh, for the Ukrainians, it was important to push the Russian fleet away, to stop the Russian fleet from attacking the Ukrainian targets, to, to, to push the Russian fleet from Zmini Isle, to push the Russian uh, uh, fleet from the grain route. And they've done it perfectly. 
like to stop Russian fleet operating from the harbor of Sevastopol or 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 like from from Feodosia and Kerch. And they have done it perfectly. Like drones are about destroying the the targets on the on the sea and interdict to prevent the enemy fleet from operating in the area and the ukrainians have done it and uh, of course like like any weapon uh sea drones are tending to get more powerful uh longer distance more explosive uh better quality uh, more modes of operating like the ukrainians uh now saying they develop the drones which can submerge so they don't only go on the surface they can submerge and attack from underwater uh, that is another step so if you let me say produce a sea drone which can submerge and which ca can carry like up to 1000 kilogram of explosive uh, that will be amazing like 1000 kilogram of explosive submerge if, uh, so, uh, uh, like ability to submerge operation radius of let me say 500 miles 800 kilometers and you control the black sea completely there is no chance that the enemy will dare to have their navy vessels out of the harbor and uh, that is actually a absolutely new level of of uh, naval warfare uh, that is interdiction uh per excellence it is it is uh, absolutely great and i'm pretty sure that the ukrainians work on that um not to mention all the ukrainians left in the hell of ruskin mirror as you said it's yeah absolutely absolutely yes uh like ruskin mir is this russian ideology of uh, cultural dominance and extermination of other cultures like we know that the ukrainian prisoners of war were forced to speak russian we know that people with tattoos of Ukrainian symbols like the, the, the trident or something like that, they got their hands amputated with these tattoos or they got their parts of skin cut out. We know that uh, the Ukrainian soldiers have been captured and on their phones the Russians found, for example, the uh, patriotic songs or that these soldiers visited Maidan in um, uh, 2012, these soldiers got either extra tortured or executed. So for, um, for the Russians, it's about the extermination of any sign of Ukrainian identity. And those people who demonstrated their loyalty to Ukrainian identity, they get executed. And that is what they do on the occupied territories. They destroy Ukrainian libraries, they destroy Ukrainian monuments, they install their monuments, they rename streets, and then they take kids. And they take kids, they brainwash kids, they send them to military drill camps starting from the age of five, six, and uh, then they they produce like perfectly brainwashed generation of of children and we need to understand that the russians think in in longer distance like they they uh, they say okay like um, maybe today we don't have superiority on manpower but now we we kidnap like hundred thousand kids or two hundred thousand kids uh and in uh, 10 years uh, it will be like uh, 200,000 18 years old soldiers completely brainwashed and they cost it us nothing they say because we have taken them kidnapped them so we don't even pay for their race during like the first like eight years of their life but in 10 years we just send them into the front and we don't care if they die and that is what the russians are doing uh that's why it is so dangerous for for us to let russians stay in the occupied region because they will just digest the population there uh, to use the resources, economic and uh, demographic, to, to, to start a new war. Um, okay, I think that um, we are already talking more than an hour and we have jumped to other topics. Uh, I think we need to wrap up now if you don't have like any other uh, questions. I'm very sorry for the problem with the sound uh, in, the, in the early of this broadcast and with the link. I promise to uh, do my best to 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 uh, 
to do it correct way when uh, we'll do the next broadcasting, so it will not uh, repeat uh, these problems, but the interesting conversation will repeat, I hope. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for all the interesting information, especially the Kachovka, uh, the Kachovka plan with all the historical fondings and also how nature takes over so quickly. Yes, I was absolutely amazed. I was absolutely amazed. Like I've been there in September, as I said, and I've been there now. And it is, uh, I have nothing to compare it with. Like, it is absolutely, absolutely amazing. And I hope so much, like, um, after this war uh, ends, that uh, we will uh, be able to enjoy, like, long hours, long hiking in that area, because it is an absolutely unique area. Absolutely unique. You have nothing compared to that, especially because of how much of history have been preserved there. Once again, like you, you walk like 100 meter, you find like artifacts there just laying around and that is amazing. Thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Have a great evening. Once again, if you want to donate for the 47th Mechanized Brigade, um, have a look at my Twitter account. There are these, these, these links with the brigade, with the nation links, or visit uh, the webpage European uh, Resilience or Erge. Um, I will write it now once again uh, in the chat. You will find there the uh, links to the nation campaigns. You will find there links to support our day by day work, like buy me coffee or Patreon or PayPal. And um, stay with Ukraine, and I hope that uh, we will be able to see some good events in the next months, as General Zaluzhny promised, and as I'm sure every one of us wish from all the hearts, and we do what we can do to uh, let it happen. Thank you so much, and have a great day, and thank you for uh, spending this hour in this uh, live broadcasting. Have a great day.